So now you're watching 对话 from Davos. 大家好，我是央视财经频道的主持人李思璇。您现在收看到的是中央电视台和 Davos 共同从二零一八年的世界经济论坛。Taking place in the World Economic Forum from Davos in 2018, so the, our theme today is China in the new era. Why do we talk about the new era? This is really the key word. I think in the 19th CPC report, new era has been highlighted 36 times, which it means something. This is not just a jargon; it actually represents a very deep. Uh, it represents deepening. An important reform, and it's not only for China. It also means new opportunities for the world. Therefore, this is our subject matter today. I would like to make a brief introduction to our guests invited to the panel today. I believe that you all know the person right next to me very well, Mr. Xiao Yaqing. He's the chairman of the SASAC, S A S C, of China, and there are other. Other guests here that you have already seen, most of the many of them are representatives from China's state-owned corporation. I believe that we're all here to share our experience and conduct exchange. So I would like to welcome Mr. Xiao and welcome all the distinguished guests. The person right next to him is、uh, also an old friend. He is the Secretary General of Anglo-Gulia of OECD. And the person in the middle is the group chair of HSBC, Mark Tucker. He was also a professional soccer player or football player, so he actually has a wide range of experience to share with our Chinese audience. Indeed, he was a professional athlete, and the this very beautiful、um, experts right next to him is Miss Jin Keyu, who is the professor of economics from the London Economic and Political. School and the School of Economics and, and Politics. So she, although she appears very, to be very young, but she has very great insights to share with us today. And I have read many excellent work authored by her.、And、the last one is Mr. Zhang Zhao, founder and chief executive officer of Honey Capital. So we have a great panel here. From the government, international organizations, academics, and many guests from different sectors are present here today. In fact, many people say that today marks the China Day of the Davos Forum. Why do we say that? Because today we have a series of seminars and sessions related with China. And this morning, Mr. Liu has gave. Given a great speech regarding the development of China, and last year Chairman Xi was also present here. So I would like to ask you what are what's your take on what's being talked about this morning? Indeed, it's a great pleasure to be here to participate in this dialogue, and this morning. After hearing Mr. Liu's speech, I feel that I really agree that the opportunities for China means the opportunity for the world, as we could see from the past years. Last year, after the 19th CPC Assembly, it has laid out a roadmap and the new goals for future developments of China. The economic development will. Be adjusted from high-speed growth to high-quality growth. I believe that representatives present here today, many of you are also going through adjusting and adjustments and reform, and this is exactly what we're doing. Towards the domestic market, we will like to enhance the domestic-led stimulation and growth and growth. In terms of external actions, we would like to open up 
and cooperate more with multinationals and other sectors around the world. All these reforms and development will be able to bring new opportunities to enterprises and companies. But all these opportunities also mean renewed opportunities for the world. That's why I say opportunities for China is opportunities for the world. We know that today, uh, this year marks the 40, 40th anniversary of China's opening up and reform. So it's very timely that we talk about this issue. So if we want to summarize this new era in one sentence, how would you say it? And what are the most fundamental or significant reform that China will undertake? So what do you think this new era really means? New era? I think means a new starting point in terms of historic transition that will take us up to the next level. We have new goals laid down in front of us, which will grant us more opportunities, more development, and we'll see the emergence of new service, new products, and new companies, as well as new entrepreneurs. Yes, I understand that uh, you stressed the transitioning from high-speed growth to high-quality growth in terms of the economy. So I would like to raise the question to Mr. Guria. So what would be your interpretation of China's era? What are some of the key areas of reforms that you're looking at? Well, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, the 19th Party Congress defined the, the new era. Uh, so we don't have to uh, be reinventing the wheel all over the place. Um, it's a greater focus on what I would call the quality of growth. And there was an express trade-off. They say, no longer will we sacrifice environmental and economic efficiency for the sake of short-term gains. We'll go for the medium and the long-term view, which is a very Chinese way to do things anyway, uh, rather than maximizing the short-term gains, because we understand that development is a medium and long-term challenge. So this is quite important. The word openness, uh, together with coordination, sharing, innovation, and green development. Those are the five uh, key words of the 13th five-year plan where we had the question of the new era. So uh, this is a key pillar of the uh, party congress. And um, now we, we welcome this opening up, further opening up of China. We think it's a win-win prospect. Um, we think that uh, you know, this China should uh, continue to make progress on uh, things like uh, the uh, services, services trade restrictiveness index, the foreign direct investment, the regulatory side, uh, they made a lot of progress, but uh, I think uh, still in a number of areas, China remains more restrictive than most of the OECD countries. It's made a lot of progress, but again, more, more, uh, more room uh, for uh, reform. Um, in our um, FDI, Foreign Direct Investment Restrictiveness Index, China is one of the top reformers. That means it may not be at the top, but it has moved the most in terms of uh, removing a, a considerable number of the restrictive measures. Now, but still many services remain off limits. Um, uh, efficiency gains, uh, for example, you could curtailing competition in, in a number yeah. of sectors. I think we can go into some of the details yeah. later, but then I think you made a very finish, important uh, point. New okay. Era, yeah. uh, about globalization with things like global playing field, defining rules-based inclusive globalization where China is benefiting, and of course, which was heralded here last year by President Xi Jinping in his address to the plenary uh, of Davos. Yeah, so all different areas of high quality 
development. Mm -hmm. So you had a very close study of uh, the report, and thank you very much for your input. And uh, Mr. Tucker, I have actually, I actually have a more specific question for you about um, China's significant move in terms of financial opening, because we know that last November, Beijing announced a new set of policies to lift foreign ownership uh, limits for the financial sector. So what does that mean for global players like HSBC? Thank you. I think just to, to support what both Mr. Xiao and uh, Mr. Greer have said, I think the, uh, and let me take the, the answer to the question sort of in context of, uh, of what's happened and, and, and the, uh, the 19th uh, National Congress. Again, we, we uh, consistent with, uh, with my two colleagues on the panel, I think view this as a, uh, a clear shift in both social and economic development and, and the way also significantly that China engages with the world. Domestically, as has been said, the emphasis is now on building, I think, again, the words used, uh, some for the first time, a sustainable and inclusive economy, where, again, the quality of, of growth is just as important as the quantity. And again, that is, that is a very clear move. Interesting, internationally, and coming to, to your point, China is becoming more active, uh, and it's advancing its own form of multilateralism. Uh, which I, I think, again, the, the President Xi has, uh, has called a new option for the world. Uh, and we believe that the main impact of this is, is pretty profound and something uh, that can lead to the creation of a more integrated global economy. So it, it's very significant. So I think the, the elements of, of clearly the past uh, 70 years or so, China's relationship with the rest of the world has been defined by the objective of moving to a great modernized a socialist country, uh, and its strategy in international affairs has been clearly managed to do that. The approach hasn't changed, but, I think it's, it's, but continues to, to evolve, and we're seeing that as the economy internationalizes, uh, uh, it's natural that China will play a larger role in a more active approach to foreign affairs. Uh, and again, the, the impact of, uh, of that is profound, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that. Within the financial services, uh, space clearly, we uh, uh, we saw at the end of last year uh, opening up uh, on, on the banking side to a degree, on the insurance side very significantly. I think moving uh, uh, over three to five years uh, to 100% uh, 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 ownership in China is a major step. It's something we have been talking about for 15 or 20 years. No. So I think it's it's profound in its uh, implications and indicative. Of a, of a positive and constructive approach. So all of this is a consistent backdrop to, uh, to the 19th Party Congress speech. Yeah, thank you for the input. Kuyu. Um, so let me start in English because of what I want to address in terms of what we perceive as a new era. Uh, I think that we are focused too much on a fi financial story of yesterday. You know, the dollar is a reserve cur currency, the US financial crisis and aftermath. The financial history or the financial story of today and tomorrow is going to be about China, China's financial integration. So what is new, and I'm not sure the world is yet prepared for it, is a first, a few first of an emerging country. Number one, it is the first time a country with only 25% of GDP of the US is leading in many core areas of technology. <clears throat> Number two, it is the first time ever that the second largest economy is a middle income superpower. That has enormous consequences for the financial, global financial arena. As we encourage China to open up more, are we prepared for potentially the greater volatility, exchange rate volatility, capital controls, because what I think is lacking still, even though we've heard so many positive aspects of it, and I'm completely in agreement, is that China still lacks the micro foundations in the financial industry with many more speculators than institutional investors. And in that kind of situation, when China opens up completely, is the world ready to absorb the kind of shocks and volatility that even a little tremor of China can send shock wakes to the, um, the global economy. So I would pose it as China's ready for opening up, but is the rest of the world. 
This is a very interesting point of view. Yes, this morning, uh, Mr. Liu has stressed the core of China's opening and reform. And in fact, the openness of China really uh, is the world ready to see and embrace that? Are we all ready for the new China? So please, Mr. Zhao, please share your experience with us. In fact, um, uh, over the past decades, I have been actively participating in investment in China, and I have been participating in Davos Forum for, the, for more than a decade. But this time, I have a whole new feeling. In 2008, when the financial crisis hit, we can see that people had high expectations of the Chinese market and hoping that as a rising power, China will shoulder our share of responsibilities. And our premier also said that China will, of course, take its responsibilities. And that means doing our job well, doing what we do well. Ten years later, now oh, we saw that um, when the economy came to recovery and we still faced with the governance issue, he said, our representative said, we have to participate in the sharing, coordinating, and the consultation of the new world order. So if we compare the statement of the two points of time between one decade you can see the shift in the point of stance of China. The economy needs to be shared worldwide, and this was true in the past and will be true in the future. Most importantly, China can play a greater part in contributing to the governance. For example, what does the market do? What does the technology or private sector do? I think this, in these aspects, China can it contribute more in its governance. This is more important than the GDP growth of China. Some people said that in 2017, we are, in 2017, we're doing much better than the past. But how we behave when things are going well it really indicates the level of governance we have, Yet, which means when you're doing well, you have to think about fixing the system and not to wait until it's too late. And China, in this regard, is doing a great deal of work, which can provide us reference. So sharing our economic growth, contributing to a new concept, and the participation in forming new governance rules will be the three arenas where China would have a positive impact in the world. Indeed, this is a very good opening to our discussion. As you know, in this new era, in the global, in the wave of globalization, China is already an integral part of the world. I have a survey. Um, it's by the People's Daily and the Research Institute of Beijing asking how China is in influencing the world. We talk about the responsibilities of superpower, the economy, infrastructure, technology, and enhancing people's life. So indeed, uh, I would like to start with infrastructure, inviting Mr. Xiao to speak. Since five to 10 years ago, China has been going abroad to work in the area of infrastructure. And as our state-owned corporation expand overseas, what, do, what difference do we bring to the world? Yeah. Over the uh, I'm, over ten years, our uh, technology and uh, our model have uh, changed, and uh, lots of uh, SOE Chinese are, are SOE uh, at the top. Uh, Level we have um, 100 uh, uh, SOE or 100 Chinese uh, enterprises uh, uh, among top 500. So 
in this uh, going global and international, uh, Chinese enterprises bring not only the infrastructure and equipment, but also uh, their experiences and uh, their vision for the future and uh, to the country that receive investment. So the impact is very strong uh, locally to the uh, economic, local economy and the local society and the local development. So I think this is our policy of going uh, global that uh, the bring changes. So I realize that uh, President Zhao um, agreed because you have a lot of experience in this regard. As an uh, investor uh, of a private company, you participated in the uh, SO, SOE's uh, project. So can you uh, share with us some experiences? So I will give you some examples. So. You said uh, we have the contribution to the global economy. I create a fund for the glass uh, industry uh, for the One Road, One Belt uh, initiative. I uh, restructured a company uh, located in Jiangsu, uh, um, a glass maker, and after the restructuring this uh, company get, uh, uh, is getting better. So we want uh, that this company become an uh, international uh, company. As uh, President Xiao said, we wanted to create a, a major and a strong uh, company, so lots of strong and the big Chinese company. This uh, company can uh, take care of the local development um, and also uh, take part in the uh, uh, international rule uh, development. We found a uh, fund with uh, 300 million uh, yuan renminbi. And uh, with uh, this uh, One Road, One Belt initiative, uh, we said uh, the Chinese SOE have lots of experiences and technologies. So we take care of lots of a project along the line from uh, China, Africa, and uh, um, Europe to improve the uh, sector of uh, glass. So this is different from uh, what we uh, did before, because what we did before uh, had uh, some conflict uh, with other countries. But now we share our experience and the technologies with uh, local companies, and we share our um, uh, talent and our uh, human resources. So I think this is an approach that we can adopt uh, as Chinese enterprises, especially for the SOE. What's the return on investment? We are a private company, so we should give an uh, interesting return on invest investment. This is, should be good and should be uh, beneficial, profitable. So this is a good uh, example to show that we can have a complementarity and we can uh, cooperate together to make more money. So not only the SOE, but also private companies that can to take care, uh, take part in. For being the best overall international bank for the Belt and Road Initiative, but I was also reading a, a report from your chief China economist, Chu Hongbing, and then he was actually writing about that uh, currently over 90% of investment for uh, Asian in, uh, infrastructure projects are funded by the public sector, and usually the private sector. They're looking at very incentive-driven risks and returns, and then how do you justify that from a private sector perspective? Yeah, I think the, the significance of, uh, of Belt and Road is, uh, uh, again, we view profound for, for, for China and for the region and the rest of the world. I think the Belt and Road, in some instances, is spoken about uh, 60, 65 countries. We've seen in our own discussions with people, this goes far wider. This goes to 90, 100 plus countries. It, it has a, the ecosystems that are created are, 
are, are very significant. The elements that uh, uh, are important from the private sector view, and I, I think as, uh, as John has said, the two elements that we look at in Belton Road uh, uh, are around the design uh, of the instrument itself and the risk mitigation of that. Uh, so the design, uh, looking at the tenure, uh, uh, looking at the, the slice of the, uh, of the special project that is, uh, that is looked at, putting this into a form that is increasingly standardized to be able to, uh, to allow others to, to, to come in and, 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 uh, and make a market. This is, this is still in process. Uh, and it may be, uh, I think this is, this is months, years, not days in, in fixing. This will take a long time to get the design right, such that it will become uh, an asset class of, uh, uh, of significance. And the other element, I think, is, is uh, for the private sector. Uh, I think the other element is clearly risk mitigation and ensuring uh, that we, to the best of the ability, uh, the risk are mitig mitigated and whether there are guarantee and other mechanisms that are put in to be able to resolve this. Again, it's related to the design. I think there's huge, huge appetite uh, for, from private investors to come into infrastructure. Uh, but I think the challenges are just in finding, designing the right instruments that, again, uh, will allow them to, to ensure that they're in their investor base, yeah. the, the owners of the assets themselves, not the asset managers, yeah. Uh, have comfort and the, the additional risk they're taking uh, is rewarded appropriately. Yeah. President Zhao, Chairman Zhao, did you uh, cooperate with HSBC before? We always uh, collaborated with banks, including uh, SHBC, uh, in leveraged buyout when we did the, the acquisition of uh, Peace Express, which is a UK based consumer brand and multiple bankers, including HSBC, participated. Uh, with Belt and Road Initiative, the opportunity is vast, especially, um, like I just said earlier, with the Glass Fund. We, as a private sector player, we needed to see it's economically viable. Uh, when we have that worked on banks, typically like to work with us so that we could have a balanced capital structure. So more to come. I, and, and again, I want to just also emphasize Belt and Road Initiative actually demonstrated the uh, strategic responsibility that China is carrying for the future world, where you share the economic growth, but you also share the way to do things and then establish, establish new rules in terms yeah. of collaboration. Hmm. Okay, uh, Mr. Guria, uh, in fact, your home country, Mexico, sits along the Belt and Road. Uh, so I was reading that the OECD actually got a framework for the governance of infrastructure, and it actually laid out 10 key challenges, uh, such as having a strategic vision, useful life of assets, resilient public demand, and the right use of data, et cetera. So how would you assess China's Belt and Road Initiative? Well, <clears throat> first, it's in the context of a already happening transformation of the production model in China, okay? Uh, now it's been three, four years where it was announced, even from the uh, uh, five-year plan before, that there will be a shift from uh, exports to consumption, uh, that there will be also a shift from investment to more services. That means a kind of a, a better China for the Chinese. Huh? And this is actually happening. You see investment as a total in the GDP coming down. You see consumption going up. And you see more people moving into the cities under better conditions with the normalization of the uh, hookahs that were, that were pending. And now, you know, uh, densification, urbanization, et cetera. So I would say what is changing now is that all these discussions about growth, infrastructure, and the Belt and Road, and about uh, you know, the recovery and everything is in the context of a more, uh, of a, a, a more considerate, a, a more uh, careful China about people, people more at the center. Um, for example, uh, poverty in China has declined 
substantially from, you know, 30% in 2005 to maybe about 6% now. But what Liu He told us over lunch is that there's a specific target of 30 million Chinese that are under the extreme poverty line to be rescued over the three-year period to 2020, 10 million per year, okay? So this is beyond whatever, you know, progress you can have because you got a new job or whatever. Good. Now, the social mobility, uh, the revitalization of rural areas, for example, um, uh, the, the urbanization process. Uh, now, cities are now holding more people, even in China. Majority of Chinese people now live in cities rather than in the, in the rural areas. So you have to uh, catch up in there. And this question of lifting all the boats, you know, the middle class, the middle class, uh, which is foreseen as a major driver of this pattern of more consumption and uh, because it has more uh, 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 income available. So in that context, you have the Belt and Road Initiative, which is both domestic, but also for, as was mentioned here, about 100 countries that really uh, could be touched by this initiative. So it's like a win for all, uh, and then it could be uh, like very much people-centered. Oh, no, a so multidisciplinary uh, approach to issues, but very importantly, balance between productivity and growth and inclusion. Balance between productivity and growth and inclusion. This is a very important new approach and new emphasis in this new era uh, of China. Thank you very much, Mr. Guria. Uh, a question to Ke Yu. You are making research on the Chinese economy, but also you father uh, took part in the One Road, One um, Belt initiative. You said that we have to connect the, all the countries in the world to uh, make this initiative more efficient. Now we know there are a different voice about this uh, Initiative. So you said that we need a convincing data or convincing uh, reason for the world. What's your uh, reasons? I think uh, we, lots of people uh, talk about the one road, one belt. But I think the, we lack the communication with uh, the world. Uh, this is uh, the main reason behind the One Road, One Belt uh, initiative. For uh, many precious reasons, we, including political uh, pressure, uh, lots of uh, country, uh, countries need need our support. And so I can say it's from a political perspective that there is a real need. And that there is also economic need for behind this initiative. So I would like to elaborate a little bit. So this initiative is about a network. Network has an effect. Um, uh, impact the, like internet. If, if you have a more um, participation in the network, and you can have more effect. If you have an infrastructure in Kenya, but if Angola cannot be connected to Kenya, you cannot do more. And norm, very often, lots of projects are in small countries, and these small countries has have no capacity, enough capacity to uh, do their infrastructure. And the China with this initiative uh, tries to create a platform with the participation of all other uh, countries. And for the states, uh, for instance, um, when uh, the states helped the, the Europe, he, the, the, the country tried to uh, create a platform with the participation of other countries, like now China. Please, Mr. Shaw. I agree with her. Belt and Road Initiative has been proposed by China, but it should belong to the world. So Belt and Road Initiative is really an initiative for the world. It's not only with the participation of Chinese enterprises, it's also counting on the participation of the world so that it could benefit the world. And Belt and Road Initiative is, is a long-term strategic project. It's not only a short-term project. Of course, we're talking about infrastructure. We have to build them together. We have to share together. But to make the content more concrete and more enriched, we have to take a longer 
uh, stand. We have to look at it from a long-term perspective. It will be able to contribute to the development of the world economy as well as the businesses who are involved and bring more market opportunities to those involved. I think that there are many guests who showed their interests in the Belt and Road Initiative. And in fact, some of them said that they, did, they are not aware that on this forum, in this Davos forum, we will have a lot more. We would have so much more to talk about in terms of Belt and Road Initiative. So I believe that our discussion today have already answered many of your questions or echoed with some of your opinions. So infrastructure indeed is more felt by the external world, the world external to China, in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative. And China has also defined its new era as the era of innovation. Innovation can be brought by science and technology, but the other one is a new business model. For example, last year, um, we have the quantum satellite and uh, FAS. And we are also seeing new models such as shared biking and shared transportation. All these new models of business or service are not only enhancing the quality of life of Chinese citizens, but across the world. As Mr. Xiao said, the innovation and in, uh, improvement of state-owned cooperations are ongoing. So what should we do to, that would allow state-owned companies to have that kind of competitiveness necessary in this in world of innovation? What kind of innovation should we do? Well, Davos as a platform is really an opportunity for all businesses to come together and exchange our views and learn from each other. In terms of innovation, I believe that we need new paradigm. Although we are state-owned businesses or state-owned enterprises, it doesn't mean that we're rigid. We need to be more energetic. Second innovation will come from not only the products, but mechanisms, we have to seek um, new business models, new economic development models. Thirdly, this innovation process should be an open one. It should be a globalized one. No one business or one type of business can conduct or undertake innovation alone. That kind of innovation would be limited. Therefore, China's opening up itself in itself is innovation. Its innovation means reform and is combined with openness. This is a perfect combination. I believe that that will lead us to this new world. So I would like to ask Mr. Zhao, well, as you are standing on the very front, forefront of the market, and investment. In the past, when we talk about in investment and innovation, we always think about Silicon Valley from the US, of the US. But now, today, uh, we're seeing that in terms of technological innovation and funding as well as investments, we're seeing a more integrated global community. And in this new context, where does China stand? Firstly, allow me to clarify, China is a very big market. He has over 400 million middle class families. This will be able to support quite a bit of weight. In the past, the economic development of China was growing on a very high speed. Normally, it's the locomotive of the world, eco world uh, economic growth. So you can say that, for example, it would, we are talking about speed and quantity. We can say that state-owned enterprises, who accounts for a very big part of the Chinese economy, they are trying to revolutionize, they're trying to reform, they're trying to uh, become better and enhance the quality. This would have an important impact. China's market is very big, and our technological advancement is beyond um, – its speed is really beyond description um, about um, – 
uh, two years ago, we bought land in South Carolina of the U.S. and invested 300 million U.S. dollars to establish a factory there. And it has been quite popular among the local populations. It's welcomed. So what really, really moved me is that we pr produce actually our goods here, and we export that to the U.S. But if you think about it, decades ago, we people bring their goods to be produced in China. So now we're seeing a, a reversal trends here. So without a big market, without the long-term st strategy of state-owned enterprises, I believe that this would be hard to achieve. So in the future, China, uh, the world will feel the potential that China is yet to unleash. Over the past decades, our development has f focused much on the technological development, especially the application in terms of consumption goods and services. Of course, in the past, we had certain disadvantages, regulatory, legislative aspects are still sort of lacking behind compared with more advanced economies. But when there is a disruptive, uh, a disruptive technology, if we have to start from scratch, our uh, regulatory response would be more effective than the Western countries because we can start from scratch. Yes, indeed. Just like you said, the uh, founder of uh, Uber also talked about this. I can echo that now. He said that this is a new business, a disruptive business. Among all the countries he has visited, China has the most open attitudes toward this new business model. And in fact, China has already developed that kind of similar model, which is the DD taxi app. So in the future, I believe the technological advantage China would have is really in the application front. And based on this technological advance, plus the economic, event, that economic development, this will lead the future growth of China. And we, as an economic power, will be able to share the fruit with other countries or other parts of the world through our Belt and Road Initiative. And now I would like to ask you, because you have always been the elite, let's say, of the economic world, and you understand very much both Western and the Eastern world. You understand China and the Western world. And many people said that in the future, the economic competition will take place mainly between the U.S. and China. And many say that um, business uh, B2C service and products are more developed in China. But in terms of B2B, China is still lagging behind. So what's your view on these business models and in the future? What's the trend for these uh, development? Um, indeed, this is very important. When we talk about trade and financial aspects, um, the more concrete point is really the uh, technological cooperation or competition. China, indeed, is a, a great market for internet-driven businesses. It's even more optimal compared to, even more suitable compared with the US market or other Western markets. And second, let me come to big data. Big data allows consumers to provide their data, and the way we manage and gather data is different from other countries. A few days, a few years before Alexander Gershon, this is a economist who proposed the economic backwardness theory, stating that when your current framework is not yet fully established, you, it's more likely for that country or for that economy to uh, frog leap, to leap forward and jump through certain development stages. So this is exactly what China is doing. And of course, uh, our ec economy in China has certain uh, restrictions uh, due to uh, the controls and uh, current circumstances. 
in the future, we can see that service sector will be very important because it brings job creation and it stimulates consumption. In the future, I believe China and the U.S. need to cooperate in terms of technology. Of course, currently we have political factors at stake, and we have big businesses to China and the big U.S. business uh, U.S. businesses to China and big Chinese businesses to the U.S. There are still roadblocks, but uh, there are still blockades. But we need further cooperation. Positioned UBS as a leading global fintech firm. But then speaking of uh, innovation in the financial sector, we know that a lot of these emerging markets, they're leading the pack, especially talk about uh, mobile payments. China, uh, back in 2016, the size of mobile payment is actually 50 times of that of the United States. So, and also these countries are trying really, really hard in terms of uh, adopting all these new technologies like artificial intelligence. So from your perspective, a traditional financial institution perspective and how do you cope with that and how do you see the competitive landscape and how do you see possible collaboration? Yeah, I think it is a, it is a very different uh, landscape to, uh, to the one we've seen previously. I think if I, if I can just take a step back, the one thing that we didn't talk about, which I think is just worth um, just two or three seconds on, is, is uh, the point about Belt and Road and, and the, the President Xi's uh, note that it should be green, low carbon, circular and sustainable. The whole area of, of sustainability, uh, uh, given the, the Paris commitments and the need for $100 trillion of infrastructure investment, particularly in energy, uh, and China is, uh, is very significant to this, I think is, is, is an area, is another whole, another whole area, but I think we would be remiss in not including this in the, uh, in the, general, uh, in the general discussions. With regard to the fintech side, I think, uh, uh, as with all innovation, uh, uh, we have to embrace, not fight. Uh, uh, we have to look for, for partnerships. We have to look for different arrangements, uh, structurally, organizationally, et cetera. Uh, the investment, and, and we, have, uh, we have been working with different prototypes, whether it's artificial intelligence, whether it's big data, uh, whether it's genetics and genomics, there's a whole series of uh, different projects, uh, the whole uh, Bitcoin technology, all of this, uh, uh, I think, is something that we we have embraced. And ultimately, in, in its extreme, uh, uh, between the the established companies, the the BRICS and the uh, and the clicks, the the the, the newer companies, uh, the Alibabas and, and others of the world, there is there is somewhere between the two extremes. It is. Uh, uh, the winner will, uh, of, of this, and there may be win many winners, will have to find ways to work with new technology, will have to look to reinvent, will have to look at their current business model uh, and tear some of it up uh, uh, to start again in some instances. And, uh, you know, as, you, as you've said, the payment space, I think, is one of those. Uh, uh, ultimately, uh, uh, where value can be added and uh, the efficiency of the, uh, of, the, of the Chinese systems and others can we be competitive in that space? These are the questions that I think we, uh, we're asking as uh, uh, established banks. Uh, but I think there are some many, there are many advantages, but I think there's a constant need to, to look to reinvent, a constant need to, to think about the model and, and an ensuring uh, that for not for one second do we remain complacent. The, the investment in technology, the market leading, whether it's artificial intelligence, uh, 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 or any other aspect of the technology, we know how much investment is going in from the Chinese side. Uh, we need to look at matching that, if not exceeding it. Yeah, thank you. And on that note, I want to ask uh, Mr. Guria. Um, I know you, in a lot of your recent speeches, you talk about uh, the emergence of uh, global value chains. And it's also, uh, you talk about that in your um, speech when you visited China last September on uh, challenges and solutions for globalization. So. How do you perceive the shift in global value chains and where do you see China positioning itself? This is about uh, the way in which we have already organized and are continuing to organize production. Production of what? Of everything, okay? Now, global value chains means that businessmen and women have found partners that they trust, that they feel comfortable, but they're also competitive, cost, you know, cost efficient. 
and where the proverbial division of labor among the different countries, depending on your comparative advantage, is going to be produced, and therefore you have, as the name suggests, a chain where you are adding value in each one of the segments of the chain. In the end, it may go back to the original where the technology is coming from, perhaps, and then they will be in charge of, for example, marketing or selling, etc. But what you're having here is particularly a very challenging situation for SMEs. Now, remember every time you see that two big giants are going to merge, what happens? This includes, you know, Chinese companies, and German companies, and American companies. They say the first thing that this is big synergies. What do synergies mean? That they're going to have 20,000 people laid off and the price of the stock goes up. It's kind of a perverse logic, you know. Now, what happens with the uh, SMEs? SMEs are the place where jobs are being created. SMEs is the place where you're adding to the jobs, where you're compensating for these uh, consolidations of the large economies, etc. But they have to be multiplied by tens of thousands in every single country in order to actually make a difference in terms of the numbers. Yeah. So you have to have a system. But are these SMEs in each country part of the global value chains? And the answer is, in many cases, no. They are isolated. Uh, SMEs in many countries means small, but staying small, low technology, very low number of employees, etc. And you basically are talking about public policies and also the larger companies, which many of which are around here, to be integrating the, as on the supply chain to have this global value chain, which in the end makes the final product competitive, not the company in its headquarters competitive, but the final product competitive to compete where? In the headquarters of that company and in, of, you know, in China, in, in Europe, all over the world. This is why multilateral approach of which, of which global value chains is a very important part is a much better, more efficient approach than going it alone or trying to keep all the production in any single country. The businessmen and women have a certain wisdom that they have been practicing, and that is integrating these global yep. value chains all over the world. China is a very big player in the global value chain. So is my own country. Uh, Mexico, and that should continue to be the case rather than trying to keep individual countries, you know, from isolated from the rest of the world and yep. doing all the production uh, in a single place. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Guria. I think Guria, since then, has talked about how to integrate the value chain. Thank you very much. We talk about the inclusive development, and indeed, that has been reflected in your remarks. And now we have a very short. We have very little time left. I welcome anyone in the audience to raise a question or make a comment. Thank you. So thank you so much, everybody, sharing us a very fantastic dialogue. Can I have a question to Mr. Guria Angel? So you have mentioned that you know, the openness very important. But to today, you know, China, although it's the second largest economy in the world and a very strong engine for the global economy, but to today, we cannot be the member of OECD. So what are your comments on that? Uh, very simply, that the reason why you're not a member of the OECD is because you haven't asked. Um, actually, let me just say, Li Keqiang uh, came to the OECD and he uh, brought a message by the Chinese government that they were willing to join the development center. So China is a member of the development center, like uh, Brazil and uh, Indonesia and India, South Africa, etc. But of the so-called key partners, those five countries, China, Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, South Africa, the only country that has asked to join the OECD is Brazil. And so we are in that process. Hopefully, we can uh, promote uh, Brazil to start the process of joining. In the case of China, 
We have said repeatedly, we are not going to be pushing the membership of China. We just work more and more with China. We have been working for 23 years with China. Uh, you know, I visit China two, three times every year. I go to the China Development Forum. All our people go to Boao, they go to Dalian, they go to all these. But also they work individually with each of, of the ministries. So the partnership with China is very strong and growing and getting stronger all the time. I would say partnership uh, membership maybe will come naturally. We are creating a, a room for comfort yeah. where the Chinese will feel comfortable, will feel at home, and they, maybe then they will ask for full membership. Right now, it doesn't matter. We will still continue to work with China uh, closer and closer. Then there will be a time when they decide, like they did to join the development center, they're now members. Now maybe they will be asking to join the full uh, OECD, and they will be very welcome. Okay. We still have about three minutes left, so we still have one question to touch upon. Perhaps Mr. Zhang, Mr. Xiao could briefly address this issue. We talk about global integration, but in this progress, in this process, do we see any cultural integration or coherence or some kind of uh, opportunities that could be brought by this kind of uh, cultural convergence. Culture is related to history. China has a very long history, and we also have a wealth of culture. And it is the kind of wisdom that we could um, provide as a value when we go abroad. For example, we have now just invested in a Hollywood film production film, and they realize that uh, th we represent an opportunity for them. So they want to go digital, and now they are go going global with Chinese funds. And now they can even um, compete with other larger filmmakers in the market. So they are leveraging on the growth of economy and the rise of China. Let me come to uh, the common uh, hum humans' uh, common destiny, a shared future of mankind proposed by Mr. Xi, which is really in line with the da Davos Forum. Just as I said 10 years ago when I attended the forum for the first time, China, the world welcomed China's participation, but China accepted passively the world order. But last year, China has taken on a more proactive view. For example, we proposed this future, common future, common destiny for mankind. We proposed the initiative of One Belt and One Road and in establishing a more inclusive and equitable as well as um, equal society. So this would be the largest contribution China can bring to the world. So after our debate, I would like to invite Mr. Xiao to make a summary. So in this new era, what exactly is the opportunity that China can bring to the world? It's development and prosperity. Development, as we have all talked about, is to build together and share the fruit together. And I would like to echo what Mr. Zhao and yourself just said. We, China, Chinese people attach great importance to harmony. Of course, competition is one thing in this era and the future. I think we can not only talk about competition, we must also talk about collaboration and cooperation. Without that cooperative framework and without that cooperative paradigm, it's hard for us to, to achieve any progress alone. Therefore, in the future, in this new era, cooperation is the key. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I didn't notice that there's a clock there. So we are right on time. Still have one minute. Uh, I believe that all these issues can be further discussed at a more in-depth uh, level. But uh, from the remarks this morning and the 
remarks of our leader this morning and uh, Chairman Xi's remarks last year all highlighted the subject and the principle of openness coming from China. So this time we have been able to outline more detailed uh, content, for example, the three pillars and set a timeline three to five years. This is very concrete objectives. In the past, most of the content would focus on a more long-term approach, but without laying very specific timeline. And this time, it's indeed have seen new progress. This has sent out more concrete and certain messages to the world. And the world can expect China to display this kind of attitude of openness and inclusiveness to contribute to the prosperity and opportunity of the world.